So how has the brain gotten so big and what are the genes? There's a medical condition referred to as microcephaly and people who are microce microcephalic have a brain which is normal in form but is one third the size of a normal sized brain which amazingly enough is essentially the same size as the brain of the chimp human ancestor. Medical geneticists have identified a series of what are called microcephaly genes or genes for microcephaly, uh, small brain size, which are, are listed here. So if you have loss of function of these genes at, at, at both of your alleles, then you develop a, this brain, which is one third uh, the size of normal. Now, when evolutionary biologists noticed the, the medical geneticists finding these genes, they perked up and said, well, these are genes for brain size. And I want to be very clear what I mean when I say genes for brain size or genes for anything. All that I mean is there is variation, allelic variation, genetic variation uh, in those genes. And that genetic variation is associated with phenotypic variation, okay? Genes do not cause traits like brain size all by themselves. They work through development, okay? So we're talking about variation in these genes causing variation in phenotypes. And, and there is also nothing deterministic about, about discussing genes for anything. Genes always work through interactions with the environment, and if one changes the, the environment, one can always get a different, different result. So genes are not deterministic. Genes do not magically cause traits all by themselves. We're talking about genetic variation here, variation in brain size. So once we started to get a list of these brain size, genes for brain size, the evolutionary biologist jumped in and said, I wonder if there's been selection on those genes that might be related to the evolution of large human brain size. And this turns out to be the case in spades. All of these genes show clear and strong evidence of positive selection. Okay, so when we compare different species of primates or when we look within humans, we can identify what we call the, the, the signature or the, the hallmarks of those genes having been subject to selection for particular alleles. And you can see some of that evidence here for the ASPM gene. Here's a phylogeny of primates, and here's humans. These little numbers above the branches refer to the presence of selection for amino acid changes. If these numbers are above one, there is statistical evidence for amino acid substitutions, Darwinian natural selection uh, on amino acids in this gene. So we had a big increase in brain size here at the origin of the great apes, which corresponds to this, and then we had a big increase in brain size here, uh, as I showed you, along the human lineage. Now, the good bishop might say, well, this is sort of a pathological condition and it only has to do with, with uh, these bad mutations for small brains, but it turns out that for a couple of these genes, MCPH1 and NDE1, uh, duplications of these genes have recently been found in the human genome, which are associated with the opposite of microcephaly, that is uh, macrocephaly, an especially large brain. And for MCPH1, there is genetic variation in this gene, which is associated with, with quantitative small scale variation in brain size. So all of these genes uh, we, can re we can refer to as genes for brain size, which have apparently been involved in the, the evolution of the large human brain. And the process looks something like this. Overall, we have a series of the mutational changes in these genes and selection for larger brains. One implication of this is that 
tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of humans throughout our evolutionary history have either died or not reproduced or reproduced less because their brains were just not big enough. Okay, when you get this sort of, of selection, it, it has to involve that sort of effect. So we've built up this brain, this tripling in brain size, and then if we get mutations, these large-scale microcephaly mutations, this whole ne neurodevelopmental system collapses back down to a brain the size of the, of the human chimp ancestor. Okay, so, so far so good, we have addressed what is a, rel a relatively easy question, the, the size of the brain. A much harder question, the why question, the ultimate question, is why did the human brain evolve to be so big? What were the strong selective pressures driving that spectacular tripling of brain size in the human lineage? And to address this question, we can use a, a, a method that was developed and applied extensively by Darwin himself, and that is the comparative method. We compare species we use variation in brain size among species, especially primates, and we say what is correlated with variation in brain size. When what changes do we have changes in brain size? And what we have here is a plot showing essentially evolutionary changes in social group size and evolutionary changes in neocortex size being positively correlated. And this is quite a uh, robust result, which has been shown for other groups of mammals as well as primates. So what this plot is telling us is that as social group size goes up in primates, that is when neocortex size goes up or down in other lineage, or way up as in the human lineage. And what this means is that there was a very special type of selective pressure that appears to have been responsible for this huge increase in size and complexity of the human brain. So the large complex neocortex in humans, by this evidence, has evolved in the context of strong social selective pressures. It wasn't predators, it wasn't parasites, it wasn't the weather. It was other humans that were responsible throughout our evolutionary history for most of the variation in human reproductive success. So I showed you some comparative evidence for this hypothesis, and this is evidence from the various functions of the neocortex uh, itself. And the idea here is that we have a system in the neocortex that we can refer to as the social brain. This is a distributed, that is in separate parts, yet tightly integrated neural system for acquiring, processing, and deploying social interaction. And I've shown you some of the, the most important regions of the social brains here, some of which you may be familiar with, we have the planum temporal and Broca's area involved in stringing words together, as I am doing now. If you have a lesion in this area, you have Broca's aphasia. You can understand speech just fine, but you can't talk. Superior temporal sulcus involved in detecting gaze. So you have a part of your brain which is dedicated to watching where my eyes are going, which may tell you a bit about what I'm thinking, my intentions. Inferior occipital gyrus, fusiform gyrus involved, dedicated to face perception. Affect recognition, down in the amygdala, recognition of emotions such as fear. The orbitofrontal cortex, involved in social judgment, when you should and when you should not drop your pants. <laughs> Anterior cingulate, Cortex, critical for what we call mentalizing and theory of mind functions, that is realizing that, that other people have minds and thinking about what other people might be 
thinking, which is very important if those other people may have an influence on your reproductive uh, success. And then finally, the prefrontal cortex here involved in complex social planning, uh, scenario building, and goal seeking. <clears throat> 